before we move into the inner circle, and I think you probably, uh, on your name tag, it t says which is who's doing what right now. Uh, could we just do one quick thing? It's going to help me. We all change seats, and then we have some new people. So could we just go around and say your name um, so that the people who are new to the room get an opportunity to hear everyone's name as well? So I'm David Dower. Oh, yeah, we'll just pass it. I'm Robert Duffley. I'm Catherine Bottrell. Elizabeth Dowd. Lisa Damore. Jamie Galoon. Chantal Bilodeau. J.D. Stokely, I use the pronouns they and them. Marta Kern. Jessica Schwartz. Joy Shadada, she, her, hers. Roberta Levito. Adjulson Siqueira. Alyssa Schmidt. Lanny Fu. Xavier Cortada. Allison Carey, she, her, hers. She, her, hers, Georgina Escobar. Elena Eagleshield. Peterson Toscano, he, him, his. April Merlot, she, her, hers. My name is MJ Halberstadt. I use he, him, his. Annalisa Diaz, she, her, hers. Cheryl Sleen. Robert Davies. Maaz Awarku. Julia Levine, she, her, hers. Teddy Roger, she, her, hers. Yuna Chaudhry, she, her, hers. Lydia Fort, she, her, hers. Grisha Coleman, she, her, hers. Kyoko Yoshida, she, her, hers. Abhishek Majumdar. Okay, so if the third circle pre uh, folks could join me here. And if we could get the microphones. So uh, for the people who weren't here yesterday, just a quick reminder of what we're doing. Uh, the, the goal of this circle is to talk to each other about the prompt that uh, has been handed out for this, uh, this particular circle. Uh, we'll let the people on the outer circle listen. So this is actually just a conversation between this group. The people who are on the outer circle, the job is to actively listen. Uh, and as you're listening, catch the things that occur to you that need to be spoken, and if they don't get spoken in the circle, bring them up when we break out into the larger circle. Uh, also, note for yourself uh, any uh, particular emotions that are stirred by what you're hearing. Those are also going to be gifts to the conversation when we break into the outer circle. And in this inner circle, similar thing, to fo just follow the conversation, the thread, and as it comes to you, what what's the next offering into the conversation. All of us have history, all of us have um, experience um, in some aspect of this work. What's the next contribution that needs to be made for an active conversation and a fulfilling conversation to the prompt that can then break out and serve the larger conversation? So it's actually fairly simple, but um, important that we keep this conversation in the, in the center for the outer circle to do its work, okay? Uh, so I think I want to start following up, uh, Elizabeth, with your um, reflection this morning and what you just asked us to do. Does anyone have in this circle um, a particular uh, place to begin with what is radical to you? Something you feel like you'd like to just toss into the center. We're talking in this circle about thinking radically. We're looking at what we could do together the people in this room and, and the people in this particular circle could do together that we might not be able to do on our own. Uh, and we're thinking about it as a radical, um, a radical endeavor. So what does that mean to you? Good morning, everyone. Um, I was thinking about this, this head curly thinking 
Uh, and I, I'm, my point to you start in our yesterday conversation, and I would like to to bring six points here to that why, what I am thinking. It's radically thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, first one, uh, we all are here um, theater pe people, but I don't believe that the theater. Uh, as we know now, as this theater with dramaturgy, the theater, theater rooms, audiences, etc., is the way to think about um, uh, climate change. I don't think really that the, the theater we know is a way. The other point is I, I think we need to, to change uh, the theater, and I think we need to act more activistically in, in a way more, we do more art and activism. And in this way, we need to work with communities. I think it's very important. With the people in the streets, in parks, in their house, in their neighborhood. And I think it also we need to forget or to abandon theater um, that you work uh, without performance. I, I think we need to think only in performing arts, not more in theater as usual, but performing arts. This is the idea of performance. And I, I think we need to, to do that, um, working, studying, discussing a little bit more about the historic behavior, this gesture concept. And we shall study to find a, a community-based performance structured in, on, in, on principles of twice the behavior behavior. I think this is the best way. The, the people have uh, a twice behaved behavior in the everyday, and I think in this exactly point we can find something with uh, climate change, and we in that can we can uh, um, force or start or or. Uh, having a, a discussion with the people to think about sustainability. I think we are thinking too much in, in climate change and we, we are forgetting the sustainability. And sustainability is very important because sustainability is not only about climate, it's not about only about environment, and it's not only about rainforest and so on. It's about social justice. And it, it, without thinking about social justice, we cannot think about uh, climate change. Okay. And mm -hmm. I think we need to start uh, to more, be more transdisciplinary. We are, uh, we are too much disciplinary. We are theater people, and we are trying to discuss climate change in a theater way of thinking. We need to be more transdisciplinary. We need to, um, to, to bring more effort and to make more strong, strong culture of peace. We, we, we don't have culture of peace, and I don't, I don't see a way to go out of this situation that we are having with this war culture that we have. And I think we need to, to valorize a little bit more the self-determination of the people, of the person, of everyone. And I, I think we need to finally uh, have some ideas about what to do with the environmental. And so what to do with the ecology, what to do with the, our, our, our footprint, our human footprint. And I think we shall need to rethink the way 
we live, we live in cities, our urban way of life. Our urban way of life is a big problem, and I, I think it's the way to think you had to connect. Okay, well, there's a lot of prompts there. Uh, anyone feel that you need to jump? Okay, yeah, let's go, uh, Lydia, and then you know. Um, thank you very much. Um, incredibly eloquently spoken as well. I uh, cannot agree with you more about how theater needs to change. I think um, one thing that struck me was the question that happened from someone on Twitter who was asking about what is the role of a designer. And you know, instinctually my thought was like, of course we cannot do this um, as separate artists in whatever our disciplines might be. And that you know, there's a, a pet peeve of mine in thinking that um, directors kind of let people go and do what they do and then come back together. And so I'm often going, well, if I did that with actors, then what would you say about me, <laughs> right? If I just said, okay, we're having rehearsal, go do your thing and I'll come back in five minutes. I don't think that designers are, that's how I should work with them. So I don't think that that's how we should work with anyone. We all need to be working together and in communities to be able to change what we think. There has to be a revolution in how we um, practice theater. There has to be a revolution in how we teach theater. Um, there has to be a revolution in the way that we think. Um, um, and I also really, really, really appreciated what you said about sustainability as a way of thinking um, because it encompasses so much more and is so much broader than when we think of just uh, climate change. Because sustainability could be sustainability of, on so many levels, right? It, um, and what is that future that we want to sustain? I mean, the way that we live today cannot continue on any means, by, on any level. The way that I took a shower and got here and came and ate and sat and all of that will be radically different. Maybe in just, by the time I'm 85, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Um, sorry. Um, Fundamentally, a culture of peace, we speak a same language there. Um, and I think that we've been conditioned to think of ourselves uh, on the top of everybody's food chain or everybody's importance list, but how we can embrace a culture of peace that includes all of our kin, plants, animals, uh, inert objects, the universe as a whole. I want to ask, uh, before we go to Yuna, uh, does anyone, uh, so does anyone disagree with any of the prompts that have been laid out uh, in this first? Is there someone who has a, I'm not sure that we all believe that, or I'm not sure that that's the direction. Because we'll get very fast into group mind about something and that will get lost if there's, a, if there's an actual disagreement. Anyone have a, a counter or a concern about what was laid out? Yeah, uh, can we just, and uh, just a reminder that we're using the mic so that the third circle, the, the people can hear us on, online, so. I don't know if this is really a disagreement so much as it is just like a mental, what are we talking about right now thing that's happening mm -hmm. for me? Because I just don't, like is, is changing theater really a revolution? Mm -hmm. I mean, like really, really fundamentally, like if we're talking about a political revolution, mm -hmm. like that's an, that, we're talking about a government, like policy giant ass changes. And wh what the hell is changing the theater, the American regional theater? If, if that's what we're talking about, I don't know if we're talking about the American regional theater. Are we talking about changing the structure of the American regional theater? Is, I don't know, is that what this conversation is? And are we characterizing that as a revolution, yeah. because I don't actually think that that's a revolution. It's a change, which I believe needs to happen. Like, I'm on board with that. But I don't, I don't know that using the words revolution and radical is really helpful in terms of like, if we're really interested in climate justice globally, I don't think talking about changing the American regional theater is really a solution. So let me, let me pull a little harder on that. So <laughs> it, it sounds as though, um, you're actually in agreement with the prompts that were laid out. You're less in agreement with the idea that the regional theater is the priority place to look to, to radicalize. Yeah, I think so. Okay. It, and it's, 
to be clear, I think we should change the American Regional yeah, Theater absolutely. because yeah, it's because problematic as I hell. I think we can all stipula stipulate to that as well. Yeah. But I don't know that that's my priority in terms of like climate justice globally. Great. I don't and think the American Regional Theater is going to change the world. Jayesha, you're having a lot of nodding. Do you want to add anything into that? Or you, as you, she said, you're, she said for you. Okay, good. <laughs> Go, so Yuna, here. Oh, okay. Uh, uh huh. Lydia, Lydia, point of clarification. Yep. Okay. That's it. I don't mean that. I mean all of theater in every way that it is practiced. Great. Uh, so April. Right. So I think my, my initial response was the, the tools that come from theater practice are tools that can be used for radical and revolutionary ends and in order to liberate the tools of theater for such purposes some of the attachments around American regional theater need to be let go. Mm -hmm. So if we're in a place um, where th there are a couple of uh, kind of uh, agreements here, how, what, what ideas are bubbling in you for how to get closer to what you just laid out? Um, that may either include this um, question of how much is it a priority of the regional theater or theater practice as we know it, um, or just depart entirely from theater as the question. What things might, be, might, might we be able to imagine or do um, together that we can't do on our own? Yuna, did you have a place to begin with that prompt? I know it's a big one, so you, and you were coming in later, so if you want to get back to where you were first, well, and then we'll Well, I think um, part of what I ha wanted to say does relate to your last question, it, and it was a response to, um, I felt very inspired by uh, what I heard underneath your six points, which was a kind of invitation to be much more expansive in our um, approach to the work we do, whether in whichever theater that might be. Um, and I've been invested in a, another kind of expansiveness which is um, this move from, um, uh, you know, in, around the topic of climate, the move from thematics to ideology. In other words, to, to stop thinking of it just as a topic and to start thinking of climate more as a, as a framework, as a context, as a perspective. Um, and um, to stop thinking of climate change exclusively and to think of, you know, as this crisis but to think of um, it as an, as an opportunity, as an opening. Um, and you know, what is it an, an opening to? to uh, it's an opportunity to think of our species, ourselves, um, in new ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that, that can be as expansive as, you know, as one is willing to, to make it. And are there some new ways that are already in your practice or on your mind as you sit here right now? Well, I, I think one of the things is um, to, uh, while it's, it's about the future and it's about dreaming, and, and uh, um, uh, Xavier said last, yesterday something that, uh, you know, I loved his formulation of, we want to build a better human being. Um, and that, that's lovely. And, uh, but then I also began to worry that it's part of this, you know, melioristic, you know, we, we're going to just keep doing things and, and fixing things and inventing new things. Um, whereas maybe a huge part of this is also um, looking back and understanding um, how we went wrong and uh, what are the ways in which we are being kind of bad human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, that has been about really committing to an analysis of the systems that have got us to this place of you know, devastation in uh, social injustice and all these things. Um, and it, it's about, uh, the, the book I often refer to, which is very influential on, to me, was uh, Amitav Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement, in which uh, he, he argues that uh, the, the condition we are experiencing now, this new climate regime, can be thought of as a kind of madness uh, that has been gradually growing in us been grown on us 
over the last three, four hundred years. That modernity was a kind of delusion that was produced in us. And the core of that delusion was to believe that we don't live on this earth, that we are not part of this earth, we are not its, its mm -hmm. uh, subjects and its creatures, but we're somehow its controllers. Mm -hmm. And that madness uh, has infiltrated you know, all aspects of our lives to the point where you know, we, we live as if we're living on Mars mm -hmm. rather than on this very planet Earth. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to me, this is the opportunity to return to Earth, okay. to become Earthlings again. Okay. Um, and and the, the question is, what are all the ways we can do that? And I don't think there's any area, including regional theater, which is uh, you know, off limits exactly. for that renewal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Uh, Grisha, I, I'm going to pull on you for a second because you weren't part of the conversation yesterday. I assume that neither of you were listening to it online. You were in transit. Bits and pieces. Okay. So, um, because you had this prompt on the way in, you, right? You, you kind of had seen this, I believe, the schedule of what we were going to be talking about. Great. So, what was on your mind as you were in transit yesterday about thinking radically and what that might mean? irrespective of the conversation from yesterday. Um, yeah, give both of you a chance. I was thinking there something simple idea that the foundation of the, a big problem of modernity or a big um, confusion has to do with ownership like owning things, owning land, actually. And so when Elizabeth and I were talking last night, I, had just, I was just recounting some anecdotes about like, uh, I don't know, being shocked when, I, when I'm, I was in Arizona and driving past signs that you know, have signposts that say, oh, this place I, I can't remember the place, but the, the Sa hum Humboldt Dewey or something like that, established in 1912, and I thought, 1912. no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> like, it wasn't founded at that time. Like, mm -hmm. this place was mm -hmm. here way before Humboldt or Dewey was there, and so I think there's, like, a very, uh, like, basic and um, initial confusion mm -hmm assumption f for human beings that has to do with ownership, like owning things, I, mm -hmm. especially this idea of property. Because I mean, objects, it's okay. It's more easy to think about owning them, but place, it, like the metaphor of land to body is very strong for me. A similar kind of unconscious, nonverbal entities, your, your, your body, you know, before you start talking. And, or, so land and, 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 and body seems like they have a lot of, in common to me, or for mm -hmm. us. And so the link from landing, uh, from owning place to owning people is um, strong, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? The idea, like, where did that idea come from? Mm -hmm. Like, how in the world would anybody think that you could... And so the same kind of madness, like, it stems from an idea that you could own a thing or own a place or own a person, so... Yeah. That's what I was thinking. That's a radical idea, but I don't think this... I don't... I didn't really want to say it because I don't really think that this group can address that, <laughs> actually. Uh -huh. I mean, I don't know I, how this group could address that, but I think that's a big issue. I well, want to encourage There's, a, yeah, there's yeah, a, sure. one uh, last thing. Ursula Le Guin, the futurist, she wrote a beautiful story called The Dispossessed, and in The Dispossessed, they don't own stuff. And I thought, well, what? whatever, whatever. And so I thought, oh, yeah, that's actually, the more I think on it, the more I think that that's a radical move. Yeah, um, I want to encourage you and everyone else to, in this conversation, to bring the things that don't seem practical, 
<laughs> can this group actually address this? We don't know. That's what the working groups will be for. But what might um, we tackle? What might the context be that we're in that we would like to change? Let's throw it in and see what happens. You have a, a response to that. Yes, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying about ownership. All of you, there's, but I disagree about what we in this group can do about it a little bit. Just because what you're talking about and the why it seems radical is because, you know, all of the behaviors, choices, actions, societies that we make come from this, from our values, what we value, what we want to create in the world, what we think is important. And those come from views, like what you just described, this uh, these basic views that one can own land or others. This ownership view is so key, and yet it's not true. It's not true. And so if it's possible to shift people's views towards what is actually true, I mean, when you think about it, do we even own our own lives? Do I own this life? Did I create it? Or... Am I in it? Because I came from uh, where I came direct from teaching a Dharma and meditation retreat in the wilderness of New Mexico, where it's clear you're in immersed in nature where there's no ownership. But there's but to draw the distinction between ownership and responsibility, you know, like or taking care of one's body, one's health, one's life one's world, one's fellow beings, you know what I mean? And I think that um, because we're, we're talking about a, everything come, everything will sort of, uh, what I've seen in my own life and the transitions in my own life is as these views, these underlying views have shifted to be more in alignment with reality, the design of things, that the choices to be made and the actions to be done come very organically and naturally out of that. And the way and sustainability as a, a view and a philosophy comes very naturally out of the reality that we are all interconnected, we are all interdependent. Uh, that and and then there's the compassion piece, which is we care about what happens to others and we want to reduce harm and so on. And so it's all. It seemed to me for a while that my work as a storyteller, as an artist, which is the work of changing perspectives. I am changing perspectives as I'm writing pieces, and people and those who are viewing and experiencing the pieces on the streets, I do site-specific theater and so on. I'm hoping that their views and perspectives are shifted a little bit, you know, so that those, they, it rekindles their innate values. What we're talking about are innate values that we all already have and that are blocked by these sort of delusive values of the culture. So how to refine them again, or it's like a process of revelation, and I think that story can be so integral in helping to shift perspective, to move that, to open up that possibility for people. Do you know? That's why I feel like we all have a role here in the work we do as culture makers, mm -hmm. okay. to create the culture of that, you know, those values, to model it, to open up the possibility for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me make one very quick intervention. Yeah. Um, just uh, as, as um, with the hope that that's one way to shift, pers shift perspective. When you say that you, in New Mexico, you were immersed in nature, I want to propose that we're immersed in nature right now. Yeah. Here, we are always immersed in nature. Uh, and this idea that nature is only that green stuff far away uh, is, is one of the one of the modes of our derangement. We are always in it. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, so this idea of story and part of my thinking around being radical is radically transforming our relationship to story and who's telling whose story, how are stories told, um, and being accountable to the fact that oftentimes what is happening right now in climate in all sorts of places is particularly people with privilege are able 
to access the resources, and they're able to be the ones to tell the stories of others. So for me, radical transformation would look like the people who are the most impacted, telling their own stories, visioning the future they want, being given access to the resources that they need to transform their realities, because the people know what they need. The people know their own solutions. And right now, we live in a society that certain people have all the resources, certain people have all the access, and there are gatekeepers, and there are gatekeepers probably in this room, outside this room, that in order for that transformation to happen, they have to let go of that power, and there has to be a you know total kind of reconciliation process. Something needs to happen where the idea of abundance and true abundance, and the idea that there is enough, you know, Econ 101, the like anecdote I tell of you know Econ 101 back in college the fundamental idea of scarcity, I was raised as a communist, my name means victory for the plow, right? Like I was not raised with the mentality that, you know, of, of the, the invisible hand. And so when you bring that to Econ 101 professor, he's like, I'm like, what if there is enough? No, there's not enough. What if there is enough? So if we start to really, I mean, it, it is deep, mm -hmm. it is deep to really start to manifest abundance in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, in your action, like, it, it like we operate from this, uh, you know, scarcity model, this competitive model, this, so true collaboration is impossible unless you really manifest abundance in your, in your body, in your mind. And I don't believe that that is something that we pay, and we say the words, but we, we do a lot of thinking about being radical, and we don't do enough acting radically, and we don't do enough actual solidarity work where we, those of us who might have some power and privilege, I'm blessed right now to have some privilege of resources, and all I'm doing right now is figuring out how to get that resources out the door. Not, I don't need it, I don't want it, I'm okay right now, how do you do that? And the people are not right now really truly willing to give up their power. Mm -hmm. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to call on you in a second, just to be, um, Julia, right? Yeah. Um, uh, because you're connecting to something that, Elizabeth, you said yesterday about the commons. And, and I, about a return to the, return the resources to the commons. Um, and I wonder if you would uh, think about how to uh, contribute more around that um, into the circle as well. So Julia, you had a thought. Yes, yeah, I really want to echo and, and weave into everything that's being said and going on in this manifesting abundance and how to, I'm really thinking about like the practical steps to um, work outside of the established institutions and those gatekeepers to, to manifest the people's power, the people's voices. So I'm like really, yeah, ready to, to think about those ways to do that. But while also, um, dismantling the damage that those institutions will continue to do if they stay as they are. So kind of this twofold, like building alternative worlds and possibilities and access and abundance for people who are already on the margins while also um, undoing the work and damage that has been done by institutions. And I'm thinking about and have been um, considering an exercise from the Go Island Performance Group that is about performing an impossible task. And impossible is relative and contextual, but I think about this idea of the impossible in terms of this um, culture building, undoing um, processes of oppression and systems that um, keep people uh, fragmented. Um, as an impossible task in and of itself, but then also on the dreaming and um, creating and collaborating together as artists, what are the impossible tasks that we want to see in performance, on the streets as performance art? What are those impossible tasks? Um. I think a lot about, I was thinking about radical thinking in terms of revolutionary thinking. And I'm also thinking about it in terms of how to challenge my own sense of being right and being um, correct about my political positioning. Um, 
because I think we can agree on a political agenda and to say, okay, we're gonna be radical, we're gonna do this thing to move the needle on X issue, but it also occurs to me that it, it um, I, I would like to invite each of us as an individual to think, what are each of us willing to change to get what we say we want? Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. our habits of mind, as artists who presume to be the radical thinkers always and to presume to be the ones that are hip and down for revolution and um, leading a movement in many ways. Um, and like those are my people and so I, I own that too. Um, that I would challenge us at this time when we say, oh, this changes everything or this is our opportunity, I would say, well, really, what are you individually willing to change and challenge about your, um, about the power you're holding, about um, the gate you may be guarding or about um, who you're willing to collaborate with? Um, and that's gonna be very different for everybody who's sitting in this circle, mm -hmm. all of these circles. And, um, and I, and I, and I was really excited about this idea of power. Um, excited because I think that knowing, learning how to step into your real power is, a, a, it's a craft, it's a skill, and it's something that you relearn. And power is not bad. Um, the kinds of power that we're really skilled at using and wielding, I think, are is divisive often in this in this societal construct in this madness that we live in, um, and it's kind of the only trick I know. Like I haven't been I've been trained in the other way of of the other kind of power, um, and I maybe. Maybe the place that I feel like I, I've gotten a taste of it is in the theater, for lack of a better phrasing, the theater, right, where you're like, oh, we're gonna, um, I mean, granted, the theater has all of these hierarchical structures and and um, shortcomings, right, as a, as a construct, but it's when I felt like, oh, this is the world I wanna live in, where we just made this thing, and it's, mm -hmm. it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I, I, guess, I guess I'm throwing out that this idea of like, what is power? And what is the power that we wanna be holding and, um, and sharing? And um, maybe to, I wanted to say one other thing about, so there's, an, there's a lot of assumptions around um, how to do our work. And one of the assumptions that I am um, gonna challenge myself with is, um, that we think experts are the ones that have to be included in finding the, the solutions. And I'm gonna say that um, sometimes the people that are not the experts come up with the most innovative ideas and to be really open to hearing um, whatever, newbies or whatever, youth or however you wanna categorize somebody who is not an expert. Um, and the last thing I'll say about um, just the commons to bring it back. I think the commons is a place where you have to share power. You don't get to control everything. You have to, um, if you do a show in the park, there may be some people playing a loud game next to you. And they're not really there for your show. Mm -hmm. um, but they get to use that park too. And maybe they'll be like, hey, what's going on over there? Or maybe not. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's kind of a check. On, on our work as artists and the control that we have. And, um, and the commons being a place of like real democratic use and, and like metaphorically and physically. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard from you yet. What's on your head? Well, I've been, um, I've been thinking the, the idea of like looking, well, there's two things. Like one, the importance of understanding the journey from our past to why we're here to, in this present moment, um, and having to wrestle with this kind of complexity of climate change and sustainability, which is integrating even a broader spectrum of um, challenges and injustices. And, um, and we've talked a lot about some of the really big um, relationships in our society that have are, are sort of the power structures that are getting us to this point. And I think, and then we've also been thinking about the possible, you know, where is it that we, what kind of world are we trying to create? What types of relationships would we like with one, and, with one another? And I think the theater and the arts, when I 
is an ecology of itself. And, and it's almost, if, you, if we think about how could we model ourselves, because I think someone was talking yesterday about, about the importance of role modeling and seeing that possibility and kind of going through those, um, that process and that discussion is really important. And it gives one agency and empowers people to move the needle. And, um, and one, I think, does hope that by the process of doing and really interrogating that current work of practice and how we work together, the work, the, um, how we um, connect with the communities. I mean, I think what I've really appreciated in hearing over the last day is is being able to go in to, you know, it can't be, as you said, th this expert, these other people, we are our own experts, our own truth makers, and understand our people and constituents, but I also think it's really important that we become, um, we are uncomfortable as well, and we, we go into new places and learn and understand the perspectives of others, um, especially if we are to tackle the kind of inequality um, that is happening, you know, around this climate change issue, and and um, and therefore, I, I do think, as um, cultural makers, just we just have to um, implement, you know, just uh, just uh, undertake small steps. But actually, I see when you take that step, it, it can cascade into a much bigger systems change, and it does take a little time, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of really question how we work. But I think the radical, to me, I, I was thinking this morning as what is radical, and it can be really disruptive change. I think disruptive change is necessary. But actually, how do you get to a more disruptive change of the system is by locating yourself and understanding the system that you're in and working in a collaborative way. And I think that's the biggest challenge, probably, you know, for us to think this afternoon, mm -hmm. how, are, how might we, in this group, think of a way that we could work together? Yeah, so I'm gonna ask people to reflect on that. What is the magic of this group? What is the, the uh, latent power of this particular group of people um, that we might not have seen before we got in the room together? Is there anybody who's, who's got a um, sense of what we might do together that wasn't <coughs> present before we got in the room? Is there, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Um, but there is some question as to what, what can we do together in, um, that we're gonna wrestle with this afternoon. Julia, you have a thought? Yeah, thank you. Um, so in terms of what potential we have together that we didn't have before we all got in this room together. I think um, I was talking to Georgina last night and we were talking about how quickly this group of people got into um, those juicy, um, intensive conversations about, um, okay, so there are the power structures, we've called those into question, but then um, the work of, um, validation that's been going on in this room, I think, and hearing um, people's uh, different perspectives, but that we're sharing um, this system of values, uh, I think is really exciting. And so, yeah, taking the next step from this validation and agreement with challenges here and there to um, plan mm -hmm. an idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I want to fo follow up on that, uh, the so. word validation. Um, I've also, for me, uh, I was talking to, I think, Marta about um, my experiences, you know, uh, in many years have been often to be um, either introducing ecology to theater people or theater to the ecology people. And it's just mm -hmm. so extraordinarily um, wonderful for me to be in a, in a room with people who care about both those things and are deeply immersed in both those things. Uh, that's just an extraordinary experience. And, and so I also want, to, besides talking about power and challenging and challenging ourselves, I also want to give a word for gentleness 
and validation and um, kind of savoring the fact that so many of us have now kind of committed to um, thinking these two systems together, uh, the environment and, uh, you know, art, theater making. Um, the, uh, I always mention books. The, the most recent book that's been extremely important for me in my teaching and writing uh, is, it's just the title of it is so brilliant. It's called The Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. Um, and uh, it's a co-edited book with many articles. Um, but it, uh, in that very title, offers this orientation uh, towards acknowledging um, the, the reality uh, of uh, our condition, mm -hmm. um, but also um, opening up the questions about, you know, what will be, what will be these new arts mm -hmm. uh, that, that this damaged world calls for and these acts of repair that, uh, that our arts can uh, contribute to. So, yeah. um, I, one thing is, is um, common, um, and, you know, uh, one thing is common here, and I think we'll get into more of it on the outer circle, but I also wanna call out that we should uh, have a post-it for folks. There's a resource list that's building, websites, individuals, books, um, that's been named throughout the, the two days um, that we could just even collect here as a thing that didn't exist, yeah. I'm having like a multifaceted, complicated response. So, <laughs> so this is, I'm just gonna name that. On one hand, I'm like, yes, great. We're all in this room together. We're validating each other. Awesome, that feels awesome. Yay. On the other hand, I'm like, so what? Like we came to this room and we're all gonna pat each other on the back for like being theater people and like we're invested in the environment. Yay. Like what? What, the world is dying, like people are dying, <laughs> bodies are being coerced, right? Like that, this is a problem. And, and we're gonna sit here and pat each other on the back? I'm not okay with that. So, so, so but on the other hand, like, yes I am. Do you know, like, yeah. that's what I'm saying, like, I'm yeah. having a, a complicated response yeah. because I'm feeling the sort of like, the, the collectivity in this room, but I'm also like, but what are we actually doing? Yeah. Um, so on that, on that mindset, I wonder if there are people in this room who are positioned, like, okay, here's my radical idea. I don't know if it's actually radical, but I'm just gonna say it. Um, what if w we in this room could create a call out to the American Regional Theater or in, like universities that have theater departments that are invested, that have endowments that are invested in fossil fuels? What if we find a way of calling the American theater, regional nonprofit theater, or whatever context we're working in, if there are people who are invested in fossil fuels, can we call the, the, the arts community to divest from fossil fuel interest? Maybe it's not just regional theaters, maybe it's like all arts, but I don't know who, like, depending on what context we're all working in, is there a way in this group that we can craft like a policy something mm -hmm to call the arts to divest from our complicity in extractive relationships. Great. Uh, we are uh, going to go ahead and uh, open this to the uh, circle, which I can also feel is having complicated and interesting responses. So let's go get some of those in the mix too, okay? I'll just tell a little um, story about my grandmother on the way, uh, Elizabeth. Um, my grandmother used to always say, um, don't be an expert. Experts are just people who used to spurt. So it was always about continue spurting. Don't sit back and be X. Uh, all right, so people, this question about radical. What can we do together that we can't do individually? What can we do together that we couldn't have done before we came into the room? Um, what um, your own responses to this conversation as well as to the writing, the reflection that Elizabeth had us do this morning. Rob, you had a... Um, offering, and then Georgiana, please. And then Xavier, and Thank you. Um, I think just to respond uh, to what you were saying about the patting on the back and all that stuff, um, the, the way I understand the comments is really simple. Uh, it's kind of like a potluck, you know, and so it's really, that's the first day, right? It's just coming to the potluck with your, like, guacamole and your, like, tostadas and, like, saying, hey, thanks for, thanks for that. 
Uh, people might not eat it. It might not be like the the flavor of the month. It's uh, but it's really just about uh, action can't happen in the void. So I think in just the the validation is the first step, obviously, of just saying, uh, "Hey, we're here. Uh, we're from uh, we're starting from a place of gratitude, so that." we can all bring our talents to their best shape because we're all different and we all have different talents, we all have different perspectives and I think what we can do together that we can't do individually is actually trigger each other's strengths to bring them to the top. Instead of, commu instead of forming one thought and fighting behind it, I think it's about propelling each individual talents to, to go towards the common goal. So identifying really those goals uh, are, are key, you know, like you were saying, do we divest, do we talk about divestment? And I think that's what the small groups will do is like try to form action-based um, goals that we can say, I'll stand behind that, I want that, or like I want the, the sustainable theater model where, you know, this happens or whatever. So I, I, I just, I, I want to give us hope that the next two days, just from like past experience, I think that it is supposed to start that way, and that's kind of how it's happening. And, and the point is that it doesn't end with that. Just like, pat on the back, great, have, have a good life, ciao. Like, it's actually about where do we move from here, and that's just the, the opening. So that's all mm -hmm. I wanted to bring. We'll go to Rob, and then Xavier, and then Abushik, and then Robert. Well, so uh, I'll start with saying that I was really so pleased, Jules, when you... Um, brought up the notion that it's so much more than climate change. And um, this notion of the broader notion of sustainability, Eisenhower had a great quote, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, but it was, you know, if a problem is too big to be solved, make it bigger. And the idea is you're not bringing enough into the, the conversation. And of course, I was ha having this conversation last night. The, the, the science is such that it tells us if we can fix climate change tomorrow, we're still in essentially the same pickle. It's part, it is an emergent phenomenon that, uh, from which there are a number of existential threats emerging. Uh, our impact on the biosphere, our dramatic, fundamental reshifting of the way that the Earth system, the living system is functioning, is uh, changing and only partly from climate change. In fact, not even mostly from climate change, and the science on this is dramatic. It's also about the way we live as humans, of course, and um, which is completely unsustainable, forget about climate change. And it's unsustainable on a scale of one to four decades. And so when Lydia brought this up, that everything will radically change. It's not, do we change or not? It will. And so to tie that back into the theater discussion, what I'm, as someone who exists on the periphery of theater and mainly in science, I'm also really fascinated by this discussion about what is theater? Um, and so I ask that question myself, and I'll, in this context, I'll say that theater is where we try on different scenarios. It's where we, we explore different experiences and ways of being. We can watch it performed on the stage. We do it in our minds, right? I should have said this, I should have said that. I live out this, what if I do that? To me, theater is what allows us to explore those things. And in that sense then, in this conversation of radical, things will change radically, they must. Theater, I think, what has to offer here is the chance to de-radicalize the radical. It's where we get to, as a society, try on different ways of existing and different ways of being. And of course, this is why governments of the past have been so eager to control theaters. You don't, if you're in power, you don't want people trying on a different way of being. And, it, and, and to th no longer think of what might seem as radical change as radical but as inevitable or as logical. So I think this is what you all offer us, is this chance to de-radicalize the seemingly radical and allow us to envision what actually must be. And not just the dystopic part, but the part where it could really be so tremendously better and we could be addressing the social justice issues that in concert with the environmental issues as, okay. as it must happen. Great, all right, Xavier? Thank you. I mean that. Thank you. The um, last hour of my life has been one of the most prolific hours I've had in a very long time. Sitting here, I've created four or five art pieces just by listening. I mean, I mean that. It's, it's, uh, 
It may sound futile. It may sound like, what the hell are we doing here? But what we're doing is we're, we're inspiring one another. So I came here, and even yesterday I was saying, well, let's get pragmatic. What are we doing? What are we doing together? How do we... We are doing it. We're actually nurturing one another right here. So um, that's pretty radical, right? That we can feed one another and then grow our own practices. And of course, we're developing relationships. We're going to go out and do things collaboratively. But don't dismiss what just happened here today. I mean, just this one hour of my life, starting with Elizabeth, thank you for making me right, you know, because uh, that was powerful. And then just listening to all these voices really allows you to, to challenge yourself to think. So don't, uh, don't be discouraged about sitting around here and not being able to solve all the world's problems because every single person in this room is a problem solver. We're all leaders in our own circles. And it's really empowering um, to be witness to this. So thank you. Great. Um, and Lonnie, do you mind taking the mic? I, I, there's, I can see... Um so I'm going to go to Abhishek and Robert and then come to you, okay? So, so let that bubble up. Yeah, uh, thank you for that very, very important conversation, I think. Um, I was just thinking that if you're talking about big systemic changes, uh, essentially we are talking about, I think, dismantling of uh, the idea of capitalism and the idea of nationalism. And these two ideas have contributed uh, enormously to the, the industrial complex which has led us to this particular place. Um, and this is visible, I think, in many parts of the world. I mean, in Tibet, you go to the higher regions, you can see lakes being dammed because of a certain kind of ideology looking for a certain kind of progress. Uh, and it's fascinating that the two countries which have made the most capitalist growth, uh, one of them is China, which is communist, and the other is Singapore, in the last decade, which is actually a dictatorship. Um, and the question is, how do we, if we have to challenge that, our theater needs to move out of capitalism. It, it has to reject capitalism at a very fundamental uh, place in terms of ownership and uh, such various ideas. Um, also in terms of, uh, you know, speaking of theater as an effective thing or not, I was just really moved by what you were saying because I, I remember two or three years ago I was threatened by a Hindu right-wing group. Um, they issued a death threat uh, for a play that I had done which was about ecological philosophy. And this is after they had already shot down two writers in the one year before that. So the family was very worried. It was all over the papers and this and that. So what I'm just trying to say is that the risk is very real in many places. Uh, and I think uh, it's not about being brave, it's about being together. That perhaps we, are, we can be concretely radical if we have gone to a place where the system hates us enough to want to kill us. If it doesn't want to do that, at least I can speak for some places in the world, uh, maybe we are not being a problem large enough. And potentially, many of our theater projects that we are doing, they could be big or small. It needs us to collaborate with each other who are not in the same delusions as we have in our own places. We have to collaborate with unknown people. We have to collaborate outside of nationalism, I think, to be able to think differently. Yeah. Great. So we go, did, someone, did I see a hand go over there? No, just the, yeah, Jerry. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm really interested in this question of what we're doing when we validate or interrogate each other's work around this idea of radicality. And in my thinking, I'm straying a little bit outside my traditional area of practice, and I'm thinking a lot about mushrooms, um, which I very per personally know very little about. But I've been really inspired lately by uh, the anthropologist Anna Lohenhaupt Singh's um, extraordinary book, The Mushroom at the End of the World. If anybody knows it, it's an ethnography of the Matsutake mushroom and the um, amazing supply chains that transport it from forests in the Pacific Northwest to markets in Japan and around the world. And um, what I, in my ignorance of, of mycology, have learned in reading this book is that what I think of as a mushroom is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's the fruiting body of 
uh, an almost invisible network of subterranean filaments. Um, and what I can't help thinking of in this conversation is that, you know, rhythms of marketing and development so often require that we focus only on the, the fruiting body that is uh, hunted and sold and consumed. But what this weekend is such a beautiful opportunity to do is kind of think about those underground networks and, and really question the delicate symbioses that cause them to fruit in the first place. Um, and the, the most striking fact from that book is that scientists have failed to make uh, these networks and labs fruit at all. Um, so I'm really valuing um, this chance to be part of this network. Uh, then we'll go to Lani. You, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I have two, I have one kind of frustration to share and then two other thoughts. And forgive me, I suddenly became very caffeinated, so my heart is kind of <laughs> pounding right now. Um, <laughs> Sorry if this is messy. So um, the frustration that I share, or that I want to share, is that I. Uh, so my friend was telling me the other day about this wonderful. You know, they were they were like, oh, this I found this wonderful um, thing where you can go online and there's this company that is um, is brandless. You can go. We can break out of buying things that are branded, and you can go online and you can order anything you want, and none of them have a brand. <laughs> I was like, "What? That is a brand. What are you talking about?" <laughs> there, like, you go online and everything is like style. You know, everything is in the same font. There's a certain color. There's, you know, there's like a thing. And I'm like, this is so frustrating to me because I feel like what what oppressive systems do and what oppressive systems do so well, and I so appreciate you bringing up the need to break out of our capitalist system. Um, it's so insidious because what it does really well is that it, it oppresses you and then it offers you paths of resistance that feed into that oppression. <laughs> so I think that, and, and like that's the reason why non, uh, you know, like Gandhi's nonviolent resistance was so powerful at the time because, of course, what the colonial power wanted was for you to take up arms and fight back because they can, they can suppress that, right? But if you go, like, what I'm looking for right now, and I don't have an answer to it, is what is the thing outside of the system that's not feeding it more that we can do that's radical, um, that's not in the language that's already present? Um, how can we, sp you know, like, I, I don't know. I have... I have lots of thoughts about it, but I don't know the answer to it, and I'm sure brilliant people in this room have answers to it. I'd love to hear. Um, so that's a frustration that I have. I have a, a thought. Um, I want. Oh, I wanted to say that I really appreciate the idea of uh, Julia bringing up the idea of the impossible. I love. Uh, we work a lot with the impossible question in our work, and and I know that people in lots of different um, mediums and forms work with the idea of the impossible. And I love that idea because I think it, it says that, it, what it says to me is that the work is never done. There's never a moment where you've achieved it or achieved something. And I think that's something that's really powerful for me and for all of us to um, think about. The last thing I wanna say is that, um, uh, uh, what, what was it? Oh, in terms of what we can all do together that we can't do alone, um, I think that uh, this challenge of being more expansive than we are is a wonderful challenge. And I think that in order for us to kind of properly be people in the world and to care for each other and to create just systems, we actually do have to be more than, more than ourselves um, and so that and in a way that we and and we already are like the modernity is kind of it demands us to be more than we are I walk around with half my brain in my pocket all day you know like I think that that's we already are we already are um, uh, just because of the just because of the circumstances of the world as they are now we are so expansive and so I think that like I thinking of all of us and whoever else is connected to this this network as one organism and the fact that we come from so many different places and work with so many different 
um, people and have a deep, we all have a deep reach in our own communities. And then thinking about that as being connected to our, like these are all fingers that we have and how can we really, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't have an answer that's like this brilliant thing, but I, w I want us to think about how we can be deeply locally rooted um, while connected to each other in a, in a way that is, uh, I don't know, that is actually connected, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. um, whatever that looks like. Okay, uh, I'm gonna uh, jump out of line for one second. Marta, um, you have um, a, a lot on your mind. Um, thank you, Lenny, that was really great. I'm, I'm sort of, my brain is also, is, it's like, no, I don't know, can't even describe what's happening to it right now. Yeah, let's <laughs> There's try. so many great stuff <laughs> happening. One of the things I've been thinking about is, is, is really how can we think more ecosystemically and move from um, what I was nourished by what you were saying so much is, is this thing, uh, you know, sometimes I think about, I, I don't, I'm not um, an academic, really, and I don't know, I don't have the language. I have the feelings a lot of what I see. And one of the things that I see that's really a problem is, the, is a difference between what I call the, 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 particulate, the particulates and the relationals. Meaning, um, and this isn't correct, this is just a feeling, but it, it seems like in the Western world, where it, it, like if you had, let's say, a, a weaving, for example, of threads, um, and it seems like the Western world is really good at seeing the place where the lines cross. And, and there's like a particulate view. And we're really good at scopes. We have microscopes and telescopes and stethoscopes and all these different things that create a circle around that crossing and we can go very deep. And we study very, very deeply. And that's why we're, um, we're really good at, um, well, I, I won't say that part, <laughs> but, but we're, we're really good at studying a subject very deeply. But, and then there are the relationals, and those are folks who often, and correct me, I could be, I'm very wrong in a lot of ways, it's a lot of Eastern thinking and a lot of um, indigenous thinking, and it's relational thinking. It's so that the, it's, it's as if the, the, the particulates are really look good at foregrounding that cross um, and going deep, and the relationals are very good at looking at the relationships among all those particulate parts. But it's the actual relationship that's the foreground. One time I got to be in Dharamsala where the Dalai Lama lives and has a, there's a Tibetan medicine um, museum there. And there was a wonderful female doctor and I asked her so, in my brash, very young way, so what's better, Eastern medicine or Western medicine? And she said, well, it depends. It depends on if you have time or not and what kind of problem it is. If, if it's a, basically an engineering problem where something is broken, then Western medicine is far superior. Or if, you know, the, uh, I don't know, your heart is stabbed or whatever. You know, you have to have an engineering problem. You have to fix it, and, it can, and Western medicine is fa fabulous. If you have time and you actually want to cure something, Eastern medicine is much better because it looks at the body as an entire system and how everything relates to everything else. I guess what I'm trying to, and why I was so appreciative what you're saying is because it's not an, yes, it's not an either or, it's a both and where we are right now is we really need to be able to think about the systems that we're in and how we all affect each other and the world and how we are going to shift from this extraordinary Western way of thinking that has been fabulous. I mean, we have cell phones, guys. We can barely live without them, right? <laughs> but that has come up with these incredible inventions, but at the same time, so many other things have been broken and have been forgotten in the process, and that, that we have to now heal so much. And so that's why I keep thinking about how can we, and I don't have the answer, but how can we look at what we are doing here as a system, as an organic system, as a, as a biogeochemical system and figure out what part we each play in that system of theater production or ecology or whatever it is. And if we're gonna do what the I Ching says about making energetic progress to the good, how do we see ourselves in that system of where we are eventually hoping to heal the earth and create extraordinary theater of lots of different kinds 
along the way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to think Wrestle about. With. Okay, thank you. Cheryl. Once again, talking about shifts of view, and how do we accomplish these shifts of view, and how are we in this room, you know, as creative people and theater makers, uniquely positioned to help catalyze that? And that's what I was thinking about. You know, well, one, one little shift of view which happened in our little group there, I think it was Uma, Una who said, was to de-radicalize the radical, to make normal the radical. Yes, because that's what it seems like it is. It's like reframing even the way we're looking at, is it, it's only the, what we're all talking about moving towards is the sane, sanity. And it only seems radical because we live in this insane system. And so that is really on our side in terms of movement and change and transition. We are going in the direction of sanity. So that's good. And, um, and, uh, and I think that we can trust that, well, okay, I'm going to come back to that. So some, some common areas, what can we do together? Some common areas I thought of that we share as artists is, and theater makers is that we have access to and trust in the brilliance of creativity and that it's a process, that creativity is a process which is inclusive and responsive to conditions unfolding and that we trust it. We all are very experienced in trusting that process. I mean, I have to say that one of the, one of the things I've, re the biggest things I've learned as a creative artist is going from a sort of a, an individual generative, this is my idea, you guys all come in and let's help realize my idea sort of attitude to how, how f much pain that caused me and everyone else to make work from that point of view and how much joy my shifting into inclusivity and we're all, you know, we're basically making this together and let's engage everyone's creative process here collectively in the community, how inspiring, refreshing, how the, what was made was so much more impactful and, um, and then the process of getting there was just so great <laughs> in comparison. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a shout out for how the creative process wants to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And then it has, and then also with our creative, when we're as, as makers of art, we, um, we have aspiration, but we hold the outcomes lightly because we ha responsivity works in response to changing conditions and circumstances, which means that we can sort of deploy our creativity um, in ways that work for each of us in our communities. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how in our smaller groups that comes up with some concrete ideas, like what you were saying. It's like, well, what works for me is, and then, um, yeah, I just, tr I think that I trust, and I feel really good to be in a, a sane group of people. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa, do you have the uh, microphone there? Whew, I feel like I'm on that uh, non-human animal on the merry-go-round that like, doesn't look like it belongs on the, the merry-go-round. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, yeah. Got, I know, got it. Going up and down. Say more. Um, <laughs> I wanted to come back to what Jayusha said about the, uh, the importance of thinking about who's telling whose story and privilege and um, before that, I think Cheryl talked about drawing the distinction between ownership and responsibility. And before that, um, is it Grisha? You talked about the um, problem of ownership. And then that comes back to something you said yesterday about like people not um, wanting to go to shows that are free, actually, like ironically. Um, and how uh, important it's, it is to actually think about the distinction b between ownership and responsibility as makers of the art. Um, and that to a certain degree, we can in the room kind of fess up, you know, how many of us, uh, we all feel the responsibility, I think, but only very few of us have ownership over stories that I think will catalyze behavior change among a broad audience relative to climate change. Does that make sense? 
like we, we haven't all had the experiences. I'm thinking of like the visual way that we, visual and, and kinesthetic way we organized ourselves in the room about a personal relationship to climate change or whether we live so, somewhere rural or urban. So I think we've already started to um, visualize MARTA, those, um, that system in that way. And I think we could do a line, it's kind of binary, but like ownership and responsibility and kind of see where we lie. Um, anecdotally, um, I used to, with my students in workshop, uh, urge them slash require them to reach out to a scientist um, uh, who is working in the field of an issue that they are interested in. And just last year, I shifted to them reaching out to someone in an indigenous community, and it caused one really big shift. Um, it moved from this idea of, I need to go get something from somebody who owns something, like owns knowledge or uh, data, to inserting themselves in a complicit or at least humble way into inquiry. So for example, one student um, shared a question that she had emailed to somebody and it was, what have I taken from you? So uh, somebody was talking about this earlier, I, I don't remember whom, but about, um, uh, it relates a little bit to Rob, what you said about like trying on different scenarios. What if I did this? What if I did that? How do we get people to, not just be interested in in those questions that are happening in the minds of like so-called others or you know people you've never met and will never meet, but actually then take that responsibility back on yourself and say, wow, they're pressed to ask questions of themselves, try on different scenarios that I will never have to. So in other words, like move beyond the enchantment that theater can offer and the immersion into the motivation for behavior change. Great. We're um, just about at the end, and I'm just going to pull one more person so that we get a lot of voices in. Allison, do you mind if I pull you in? Um, <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm pulling. Pull that thought into the middle, please. Turned into God. Here I am. Allison Carey, please stage your. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Just. Where were you? <laughs> Um, well, I, I was actually looking at the num. I, I realized where I was in that moment is, look at that wall. Yeah. And like the whole, that thing that I'm theoretically requiring of myself to pay attention to the world. And I have been sitting here for how many hours and I just saw that wall. And that's an awesome fucking wall. And like there's so many stories in it, right? You can see different times that it's been held and manipulated and, and, and the things that have done to it. And so that's honestly where I was. Mm -hmm. All right, so. <laughs> Allison and I, thanks to the blessed Doris Duke Foundation, got to go to the UN Climate Conference um, recently, which was, um, you know, that's the one where the, the Paris Agreement was, was created in Paris. We got to go to Morocco, to Marrakesh, which is incredible. And there are so many stories <laughs> in what's really happening about climate change right now that, and Rob, I'd love to talk to you later about, but you know, that scientists, you know, they don't, they're not supposed to talk about their emotions or about, you know, the politics or the, very much, or the policy leaders aren't supposed to really reveal things. And I guess what I'm sort of blabbing about is that one of the things that we're trying to figure out, or I'm trying to figure out, is, you know, can we insert artists into these situations of real life and death drama that's happening right now that whoever is talking about, you know, the sec behaving the second, how does that thing go? That yeah, the modeling the behavior and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, it's real, and but we don't have, we're not privy to those conversations often. Mm -hmm. And how can those real life, non-SDA, non-sucky didactic art, real life experiences, you know, can be then translated to people so that, that they can be, it can be visceral can feel it. You can see all the, God, what are the threads of the, of the mushrooms that are underneath? That are mycelia, no, mycelia, right, right, of all that stuff that's really happening that then to percolate up. Okay. Anyway, sorry that was a little departure, but I just was so inspired by Allison because, because Allison um, and okay. others brought uh, story circles to that gathering that were at the United Nations that were so 
unbelievably powerful. It was so amazing. And you know, that's a little infiltration of theater into context that we might not necessarily think of. Great. Sorry for that digression. So uh, we're going to go ahead and do the break, uh, uh, right, Jamie? And uh, tell us where we're going next. Yes. So um, before we go to break, can we give David Dower, who has been our shepherd through the past in three inner circles, a round of applause? Thank you, David. Um, so we are going to take a 10-minute break. Um,